Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for August 9th, 2020, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, are the first reading, 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. The alternative uh, first reading is Genesis, chapter 37, verses 1 through 4, continuing with verse 12 through 28. The psalm is number 85, verses 8 through 13. And the second reading is from Romans, chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. And our gospel will be Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And the action of the events recorded in this gospel moved very quickly, uh, beginning with immediately, but the setup is not in the verses assigned to today's lection. So in preparing to preach this moment of a full-blown anxiety and, and concern, I would cause your listeners to remember that this is the morning after one of their most astonishing experiences with Jesus. These were the very same disciples who had just the evening before observed Jesus feed the equivalent of a mega church congregation with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And for me, 5,000 seems, 5,000 men plus women and children seem like a good enough number, but uh, that is not even what we think of as big these days when we, we think about gatherings of 100,000 or 200,000. Um, but it's after that incredible moment of, of, of seeing uh, Jesus work that the disciples are now um, uh, waking up groggy uh, after what should have been a night of rest and they find themselves in the midst of a storm. And it is at that moment where it seems Jesus is, or for them, Jesus is not present, that they see this figure uh, of coming to them on the water. I, I love the, the drama in this text, and I would set that up, but I would also set it up in the reality of, of pairing it alongside of appreciating um, what they've seen in the past um, that leads to almost forgetting what God has done or what Jesus has done uh, when they're afraid in the midst of the storm. So, so that's how I'd start off. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's important, right? To, to think about what is that larger setting? What is this always, what is, you know, what is a story like this follow and what's happened up until this point to uh, give us a sense of, of the meaning of this passage. And a couple of things you said, Joy, are I think really uh, critical. One is this, this, uh, and, and this expectation or this uh, wondering of where is Jesus. And so one of the features of this passage or one of the critical aspects of this passage is, is that reminder uh, that we get in verse 25, take heart, it is I do not be afraid. And so it's a reminder, uh, it's a reminder to the disciples of who Jesus is. I am the, I am Emmanuel, I am God with you. And so it's, uh, that's, you know, really a central port piece of this, of this passage uh, to remind us, to remind the disciples and to remind us that uh, who Jesus is now is God with us. And, and especially, or maybe um, indeed when we don't necessarily expect God to be with us or we wonder when God is with us. So I think that's another, that's one direction that we could take. You know, another thing that you said, Joy, that I, I it, what's come before, and, uh, and of course, there has been a stilling of the storm prior in, uh, in chapter eight. And so Jesus has been on a, you know, 
in a boat on a on the sea with them prior and so it's this it's also this uh it's this reminder too or this recalling of of the way in which wait jesus has been here before jesus has been with us before um and why is it that we can't necessarily recognize it now so yeah a couple of really i think really important things that you mentioned there that you could follow in terms of of a uh, homiletical direction I still don't know who he is or how committed he is to them. We haven't had the who do people say that I am moment yet in Mark's gospel. They made a mistake around the feeding story. They wanted to send the crowd away and Jesus said, no, 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 we're going to take care of this. So, you know, how committed to them is he? He's told parables about all this seed that doesn't bloom, that doesn't grow. He's told parable about the, this pretender, these weeds that come in among the wheat. Uh, John has just been killed as well. There's this, you can imagine that his, his, his absence from the boat might have caused a little bit of concern. When is he coming? Is he just going to pray? How are we going to see him again? When is he going to catch up? The, I don't know if you've seen the, the TV series Messiah on Netflix uh, or not, but one of the things that drives that show that's interesting is the, the messianic figure in that show. It's is mobile. He leaves people and then goes to other people. And there's this kind of concern about, is he going to leave us? You know, do we need him and all things like that? I would imagine that's a big point of, of concern. And so when they see this thing that looks like a ghost, and then when Peter is like, is it really you? And the, and the test for Peter is, if it's really you, it's not so much do a miracle. I think it's um, stay close to me or let me become close to you, right? There's this idea, Peter wants proximity. Uh, in this moment, and and Jesus provides that, even though Peter has his troubles. I'm I'm puzzled by Peter's reaction. I mean, um, that is in the midst of storm, right? So they see Jesus. If it's you, uh, why wouldn't you go calm the raging sea? But instead, it's um, I want to get it right. If it's you, command me to come to you on the water. What do you make of that detail in Matthew? I'd imagine there's plenty of other spiritual fig spiritual powers that might be able to calm the sea. And so, but Peter wants to be close to Jesus. He wants to be next to him in this moment. And so one, one of the interesting things, the other thing I, I just want to jump in before I finish here, which is it, they, the scene ends with sort of a semi confession of faith before Peter's, uh, before Peter's confession in 16. So you get truly, you are the son of God which is a messianic title, um, although it's, uh, you know, um, they're tied together in the Old Testament, Messiah, Son of God, are sort of synonyms. So, sort of interesting. The, 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 you are seeing a unfolding understanding of, of who Jesus is. In terms of your question, um, I, I think it might uh, be worth asking the congregation in light of the things that they've already seen God do, what would it take for them to say, if you command me, I'll do it? I, I think that, that that's what your question prompts prompts for me. Um, and, in, and in some ways, there's a similarity if I could push us into uh, the uh, First Kings text, because there's another expectation of the spectacular and the dramatic, and the question of what what does it take for us to trust God in a moment when we're most afraid? Do you want to move there? I have uh, one other one uh, before we go there, and I think that's a that's an important uh, segue. One other. Uh, thing that I wanted to highlight is uh, the phrase in verse 31 where Jesus says, uh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Uh, it's not you of no faith. Uh, you know, it's you of, of little faith. And there are a couple of important places that that has occurred. One is uh, the last time uh, the last time they were in a boat on the sea together. I mean, the stilling of the storm. So in, in chapter eight, Lord save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid you have little faith? And so it's just this really interesting, uh, really interesting 
I think, thing that you could explore with regard to, you know, it's not that they don't have any faith, but what kind of faith do they have and what does it lead them? What is Jesus getting them to see? And then in chapter six, uh, back in the uh, back in the Sermon on the Mount, you have also that same phrase where uh, where Jesus is talking about uh, do not worry uh, and do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what will you drink. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow and is thrown in the oven, will uh, will God not much more clothe you, you of little faith. And so I think if we put that phrase in the context of where we've seen it before, uh, it, it opens up possibilities for what is, what is it that Jesus is trying to get the disciples to see uh, with regard to particularly their life of discipleship and taking that back to those instructions that Jesus gives them in the Sermon on the Mount. I think that would be, that's the one other direction I would take this passage uh, potentially for a sermon. Yeah, it's not a problem in Matthew to have little faith or to be a person of little faith. We don't want to grow out of it, but it's not necessarily a sharp criticism the way it might if it was uh, present in some other Gospels, for example. I think Elijah's got little faith or something. You think? You think? <laughs> Something's going on there. I mean, you know, it's a bad day, but... But it's also an encounter with God, and it's a, it's a surprising encounter, or at least not exactly what he expected. Well, that's part of it, right? Maybe that's that's one of the connections, is you have uh, where will God be revealed, or where will God reveal God's self, and how will God reveal God's self? And, uh, and so there are uh, those expectations with regard to what, what the disciples have known, and of course what uh, uh, what Elijah has known with God, uh, and and the expectations of of the great and the com the greatness of God and how God, uh, God uh, the expectations of God the God's theophany, and yet and that and here there's a different kind of revealing of God's presence, and I think that could, you know, this is going to be later in the summer. We don't know what. Uh, where we will be in our COVID reality, but I think that's something to which people can relate. Of and we've talked about this before in the last few weeks of of the the places and spaces where we expected God to show up or where we expect to meet God uh, are not our usual spaces and places. And so uh, so we're listening for God to uh, reveal God's self, to show God's self, paying attention to where God might show God's self in different kinds of experiences. And maybe you invite people to think about, uh, think along those lines um, when it comes to this passage. Yeah, this is a this is a hard passage for me uh, on two levels because um, I don't know finally what I think about it. Um, that is on how to understand the the key phrase "still small voice" or "sound of sheer silence," depending on which translation you take. And I just don't know. You know, for uh, you know, for millennia, it was understood as "still small voice." Um, and recently, it's uh, it's switched over in at least the NRSV and in some interpretations to the sound of sheer silence. Um, and then I don't know um, how to understand this within the overall arc of Elijah. Uh, whether it's clear God's not happy that he's there, that so Elijah's had his great triumph in First Kings eighteen over the prophets of Baal. Then Asherah, I'm not Asherah. Um, uh, help me out. Um, Jezebel wants to kill him. And so then he runs. So he's just had this moment of great faith where he's overcome all these prophets. And then he, uh, Jezebel wants to kill him. So he runs away. Then God sustains him. So the first uh, seven verses of chapter 19, God miraculously sustains him. So he can run 40 days on this uh, bread. It, you know, so you're getting a call back to manna. And then he arrives, he, he goes back to, to Mount Horeb, uh, which is Mount Sinai, the place of revelation for Moses. And he's seeking some sort of revelation. And God's like, what are you doing here? You know, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And he's whining, you know, I alone am faithful. And God says, no, you're not. I got, there's lots of people. I mean, there's a significant remnant still that are faithful. So I don't know if Elijah is then being sent back 
or being fired. I mean, this, there's different, uh, different. Uh, I mean, that is our colleague, Mark Thronfight, who's recently retired, his interpretation, he's being fired. So he's told, here's your replacements, go do, go anoint these people in your place, then you're done. Although then he continues into uh, Second Kings. So I don't know what to make of the story. I do love the idea though that, right? I mean, this is a, this is great for dramatic telling, right? You know, there was a, you know, the sound of a great wind. But God was not in the wind, right? And the earth. So you're getting these big, normal theophanic things like match up with the gospel, um, you know, the big storm. But then you're getting it's either in the still small voice. Um, so I, I, you know, it's a great dramatic text, but I finally don't know which interpretation I buy. What do you guys? Which which way do you guys lean? I've always assumed he was being replaced, but but gently in the sense of um, the God, the God meets him and the God's reminder is there's a remnant and there's always a remnant and you're really not alone. And um, so I don't, I don't hear necessarily, I don't want people to hear fired or replaced as a sense of has, that he's failed, that he's let God down or that he somehow is, is now no longer useful as a prophet or something like that. I um I I appreciate being reminded uh that the idea of the sheer silence is a new way of reading that that we had talked about this still small voice. Um I am struck by the sheer silence translation because it doesn't actually say that God is there. It says that at the sheer silence Elijah comes out. So it's the silence that captures his attention. And uh, so homiletically, what I would want to do with this would be to move the congregation to ask, um, what is our response to what we think is the silence of God? And, and using that translation uh, w w without um, uh, lifting up that translation without comparing it to the other, but to lift it up and say, what, what, what's your response to silence? We know to say, thank you, God, when things are going great, when they're going our way. But even just like the disciples in Matthew, um, in the midst of the storm, when your enemy is chasing you about to take your life, and then you don't hear God, or God is to use the still small voice, only a whisper. How do you respond? That, that, that's how, how, I, how I read that, or how I would work with that. I think I, think I hear it as, uh, I, th I like that a lot, and I think I also hear it as uh, it, it, the, that the, the, whether it's a whisper or whether it's silence, that the it, that it's just the total opposite of what you would expect. Uh, I I think that's I think that's the the that's the tension that I hear. You know, it wasn't an earthquake, wasn't a wind. You know, like you were describing, Rolf. You know, this big wind, this big earthquake. But yet, it's like the totally it, the total opposite thing. And so, I think homiletically too, that invites the same kind of. Uh, that uh, same kind of tension there that you talked about, Joy, of what is our what is our response to God's revealing of God's self in the you know just what we would never never guess would be a theophany or just completely of how we how we have expected God to manifest God's self. So that's I, I think that's kind of that's where I would take it. Well, no matter which way you take it, it's a fun text and uh, it commends itself for those people that are, uh, in my view, for those people that are. Uh, using this uh, Old Testament text, but there's another, uh, the uh, uh, the thematic, or no, sorry, the semi-continuous text is the start of the Joseph story. I apologize for the noise uh, in the background. Uh, I don't know if you can hear it or not. It's my coffee machine turning itself off, which is itself a theophanic moment in my daily life. But uh, see, we got two weeks now to do Joseph. If you're if you're in the semi-continuous. Um, and especially if you're preaching through the Old Testament, which I know some people are, you've got essentially two weeks to do the whole of the Joseph story. Uh, here you get chapter 37, uh, which is Joseph the jerk. Uh, you know, uh, he, he's got a bit of, 
uh, first of all, you're seeing the dysfunctional family system of Genesis continue itself, um, where, you know, where you've had lots of dysfunctional things going on between brothers already uh, and between parents. And now you, that continues. Um, and it ends with this horrible act of infidelity that um, Joseph is made into a sojourner to use the, or, you know, that is the one thing you'd never want to be is separated from your family, but he's made into it by his own family, which are supposed to be the ones who care. Isn't which, he sold into slavery here? I mean, it's more than that, isn't it? I, correct. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that is, the Old Testament was a kinship-based society, and your kinship group was your whole reason for life that you, you lived to support it, but they were also supposed to be the safest place for you, and his very kinship group then sells him into slavery. I mean, the sense of betrayal, and, you know, I think in the summer uh, uh, that we've had of, uh, the, of our nation and really a, a lot of the Western, civil, uh, Western countries coming to a sense of the rat, just the massive injustice that people of color have faced, that this might be a text that really speaks into that. That is, the very people who are supposed to be your brothers and sisters are, um, the system is against you. I mean, it seems to me, sold into slavery, this might be able to speak to this moment. I uh, really appreciate that, Ralph, uh, because uh, it, it is an exposure of the dysfunction in the very people of God, the very family that is supposed to represent God, uh, God's uh, goodness uh, uh, in the world, blessing, that's the word I'm looking for. And um, I, I would, you know, we've um, talked about uh, when you uh, read the story of the prodigal son, to read it from the elder brother's perspective. And uh, I think in light of what you've just said, uh, Ralph, that uh, a way to take this would be to take the position of the brothers, um, to paying attention to the importance of what the elder brothers are supposed to be in bringing up the next generation in a kinship community. And yet out of jealousy, out of a scarcity mentality out of a lack of trust uh, in their father for his favor for this brother, uh, which has echoes of Cain's lack of trust of God uh, for his favor for his brother. Um, their response is to silence, to destroy, to remove. Uh, and is that not what we do when we participate in the us versus them systems that are our society. I really appreciate that that take on it, Ralph. Even the moral calculus that goes on here, let's not kill him. That wouldn't be right, but let's enslave him. I mean, the, the idea of how this is somehow the better choice is really interesting. You could play with that in a sermon a little bit. But as well, I would, I, if I were preaching this text this week, I would lift this out of its historical and narrative context and make it a, a modern day parable in some ways. So you, you've got the lines of the brothers there in verses 19 through 20, which are also on the plaque outside of the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, uh, commemorating where, where Dr. King was killed. Here comes that dreamer, let's kill him and see what comes of his dreams. And, which has now become a civil rights museum. But to talk a bit about that and, and the, the human propensity toward violence as a way of shutting down dreams, as a way of shutting down a certain hope for the future or a certain image. And I, I'm not sure there would be a, a gospel moment in that sermon. I'm not so sure I would take it somewhere to say, hey, you're all forgiven now. I think I would let the rest of the service carry that weight. But this is, um, this, this story is many things. One thing it is, is also a parable for, um, for, for us to hear, for me to hear today. Caroline, I, you haven't said anything on this. If I jump in though, um, uh, Matt, on your idea of not jumping to the gospel uh, in that, this is one of the places where telling the story, trusting the story, moving through the story week after week, slowly, is important. So thank you for saying that. 
Yeah, I think if there is a gospel uh, moment in it, I suppose it's that um, the the dreams that come from God can't be destroyed. You know that uh, because because they come from God. Yeah, the only thing I would add to the modern day parable too is uh, the the fact that it, at, le at least in the United States, uh, you know, several months ago, we'll see where we are now, but, uh, but the um, deferment of the DACA um, acts. And so, you know, the dreamers act. And so that this, this idea of the way in which we think of, 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 of how dreams, <laughs> how dreams get uh, manifested and the way, and the way in which, um, and what do we do with people who have uh, dreams and aspirations and, uh, and it, even when they're the same as ours. And so it exposes a kind of, it, it exposes a kind of uh, the human condition or human behavior to, uh, to that sort of uh, qualification and calculation of comparison uh, that, uh, that I think um, also sheds light, as you said, Matt, you know, in terms of a, modern day parabolic sense of the human condition and human propensity toward the, those kinds of behaviors and as well, so. And I might even edit that and say, you can replace human with white uh, in, in this case. And so I would, I would go there if I were preaching. Say that again. Instead of talking about the human propensity to use violence, I would talk about a white propensity to use violence if I were the one preaching this text. As a, as opposed to hiding, couching all of this in a larger vacuous sense of a human condition. Those of you watching on video saw me use air quotes. I'm really embarrassed, but uh, do I mean, I mean, I, I would, if I were a white preacher preaching to a predominantly white congregation, I would want to make this more focused than just the human condition and talk about um, what that means for being a, a white person in this country. But. And I might get in trouble for this, uh, Matt, but if I were uh, preaching in terms of an African-American context, I would ask the same question of ourselves because the human propensity to sin is that we don't dismantle the systems. So Caroline's done a wonderful job of adding to this, not the black and white conversation we're so comfortable with, but the reality that our uh, Hispanic brothers and sisters have been dreamers too. And, um, and, and that would be true beyond just black, white, and brown. But um, that the reality is, is that if we continue the system that perpetuates this us versus them, it doesn't matter who we are, it just matters how we act when we have power in our hand. And so, uh, so thank you for saying that, Matt, and for letting me venture in to call that out for myself as well. Letting you, I would never stand in your way. <laughs> I have a question for Ralph. Um, it's looking at the Psalm. So um, is it appropriate in uh, Psalm 85 here, verse uh, 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 at 10, where it, it says uh, um, righteousness and peace. Is it appropriate to translate that righteousness to justice? Um, it, it'll depend on how I take this psalm, depending on how you answer that one. Uh, I'm almost certainly sure that it is not, um, but uh, let me just make sure, let me just check to make sure. And the reason is that um, the word, the word is tzedek, it's not mishpat. Uh. However, tell me which direction you're going because I mean, the, the deal is that righteousness is the quality that the individual has who does justice. So, I mean, there's a connection. Um, so if the idea of righteousness is um, God's faithfulness to the blessing of all the world demonstrated through the blessing of Israel, um, that, that, that's the way I'll go because it's not the, the, the same word, which is why I asked. But what I was thinking of it being the same word is that this is what righteousness looks like, that, that it, it is... Um, it's, it's not merely a ritual 
or a habit, but that it is a righteousness of the heart, that it is an attitude, um, and I would have said an attitude of justice, an attitude of, um, of, of peace, uh, of, of steadfast love, um, and, and of, to use the word salvation in a way that sets the captives free and um, feeds the hungry, you know, all of those full embodied actions. Uh, so that, that was why I was making the comparison there. It's such a it's such a beautiful ending to a difficult, well, not a difficult to understand psalm, uh, but it's um, it's such a beautiful poetic ending that it's really hard to get a grasp on what it means. I mean, that is all you're getting. God is not any different than God's own qualities. What are the qualities that make up God? It's God's steadfast love, faithfulness, righteousness, peace, fidelity, salvation. And so God, these are actually seen, God's qualities that are embodied and, uh, and um, you, know, you know, just to tie it into what we've talked about earlier in, in the podcast is, you know, for, for oppressed or otherwise marginalized, uh, for anybody that's experiencing just um, life as the opposite of what it should be with a good and powerful God in charge of the universe that this is what it's going to look like someday, you know, uh, that the qualities are no longer vague um, ideas, but they're actually incarnate, I mean, made manifest is the, a better word. We should, uh, we're pretty long in the podcast here. We should at least move to Romans uh, because we've got a whole bunch of Romans coming. We've been in Romans, we've well, got more coming. We've been in Romans and we're in a critical spot. Uh, there's a commentary on the website written by a guy named Matt Skinner. Um, I'm not sure if I've heard of him before. Uh, so a very fine commentary, uh, in particular, noting where we are in Romans, which is a, a, a critical place uh, in Romans 9, 10, and 11, where Paul grapples with uh, the, the question of, of God's faithfulness to God's people, uh, the Israelites. And so, uh, so that's certainly, um, that, that I would, I would direct people to, uh, that commentary. And, and as you've been moving through Romans, is that the place you want to go? I, I, the, the one thing that I was thinking about this with this passage this week is, uh, I want all preachers out there to, uh, before they do anything with this passage, before they uh, think about preaching it or whatever, uh, to hear it, uh, to hear it as gospel for themselves uh, that uh, it's it's things aren't getting easier <laughs> uh, churches opening up not opening up what does that look like uh, and uh, and and so uh, what if you just heard this uh, passage as promised to you how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news with which you have been charged this is a typical often used ordination passage and I, I just, uh, I would encourage preachers first to hear it as a, a promise to them before they make it uh, a, a sermon as a promise to others.